Now, now that we knew where the Indians were located, you gotta be there. Are you okay. What is that? I don't know. What? Okay, now that uh, Terry has the location, he's very confident that they're probably at the Little Bighorn River, but he's not positive. He started making some decisions. Terry made the decision that he and Gibbon would lead Gibbon's infantry. So a decision was made that Gibbon and Terry would lead Gibbon's infantrymen. Now Gibbon and Terry were going to move up the Yellowstone River, remember they're at the mouth of the Rosebud on the Yellowstone, they're going to move up the Yellowstone River and head towards the Bighorn River, which is by Hardin, Montana. So they're going to cover and try to find out if Cus find out the Indians are on the Little Bighorn, right? Would that make sense with their plan there? They're going to proceed up the Yellowstone River and head towards the Bighorn River. What do you think they're going to have Custer do? What? That's where they're going. Well, you're, no, I, I shouldn't be so quick to snap. Close. The Bighorn River. That's where they're heading. But where's the Custer is eventually going to get the Little Bighorn because it's a tributary. But where? What other areas he got to check first that they think they might be at? Rosebud. Rosebud Creek. So Custer and the Seventh Cavalry are going to go along Rosebud Creek toward the Little Bighorn River, which is more southward. Okay. Terry and Gibbon are going to go along the Yellowstone, which is more westward, and try to meet somewhere and find these Indians. That's the idea. Okay? Now, if, kind of bear with me, if Custer and Terry go this way, they're here, they're at the mouth of the Rosebud, and they go this way, actually the other way, which way are you staying? No, I'm right for your advantage. You got a picture of a big thing of Montana here. They're going to go along the Yellowstone River this way, and Custer's going to go down this way in Rosebud Creek, and eventually they're going to get by the Little Bighorn River, and what are they going to have these Indians if indeed they're there? So they're going to be in here. Surrounded, right? So Terry and Gibbon are going this way, Custer's going this way, they're going to get to here, and what are they going to have these Indians if they're there? Surrounded. That's the idea. So, the last thing we'll talk about today are Custer's orders, the orders he receives from Terry, and Custer's advance to the Little Bighorn and what happens. Okay? This is really important. Now, after Terry studied the plan and made the decision that he and Gibbon would go on the Yellowstone River and Custer would go on the Rosebud Creek toward the Little Bighorn, he gave Custer four directives. Four. These are the orders that Custer was given by Terry once they made the decision where each was going. Now I want you to really write these down and listen to them because they're crucial. Order number one. Custer was to travel down Rosebud Creek, like we talked about, toward the Wolf Mountains to try to locate the hostile Indians. Again, Terry's first order to Custer was to travel down Rosebud Creek, like we mentioned, toward the Wolf Mountains to try to locate the hostiles. Travel down Rosebud Creek toward the Wolf Mountains and try to locate the hostile Indians. That was his first directive. Number two. If Custer did not make contact with the hostiles, by the time he reached the Wolf Mountains, he was to send Indian scouts from that point on to find the exact location of the Indians. So is he supposed to go past the Wolf Mountains according to that order? No. 
He was to travel down Rosebud Creek toward the Wolf Mountains looking for hostiles. Number two, if he found no hostiles, by the time he got to the Wolf Mountains, he was to stop at the Wolf Mountains and send scouts out to locate the hostiles. The third order he was given, because in reality, not knowing the number of Native Americans there, they really believed that the Indians would try to run. So the third order was Custer was to protect his left flank at all times, making sure that the Indians did not escape the soldiers from their left. So if I'm marching with my men toward you, I am to protect my left flank, that area way over there, to make sure when we push towards these Indians that they do not scatter this way. Okay? The right flank was going to be covered by who? Huh? Given and Terry. So the idea was protect your left flank. Always be aware and make sure the hostiles do not escape your left flank. That was the third order. The fourth order is once they found the hostiles, what was Custer supposed to do? Do you think? Wait for Terry and Gibbon. And we're going to talk about that because there's some controversy on that. So, order number one, travel down Rosebud Creek toward the Wolf Mountains and try to locate the hostile Indians. Order two, if you do not make contact with the Indians by the time you reach the Wolf Mountains, send scouts from that point on to find them. Three, under all circumstances, protect your left flank. Do not let the Indians escape. And four, what? What's four? Wait for them to get there so they can engage the Indians. However, historians note that Terry did tell Custer, do whatever's necessary if you have to. So does that give Custer a little bit of an out? Okay, we'll talk about that. Now, here's something kind of weird. Terry offered Custer Gatling guns and four companies of the 2nd Cavalry to go with him. Because who is in command of the 2nd Cavalry? Terry. But a cavalry like the 2nd has several companies, might have eight companies. So he offered him half of the 2nd Cavalry and Gatling guns. You know what Gatling guns are? In those days, that was a big thing, man. You just go like this and it just like a machine gun. Yeah, that would help you, wouldn't it, in the battle? Custer declined to take the Gatling guns. Why? They were heavy. And he did not want to impede his march and be slowed down. It took four pack mules to pull one Gatling gun. That's how heavy they were. And he did not want to have his march impeded. Now when he got there, getting ahead of ourselves again, I bet he wished he'd have them. But he didn't. He turned them down. Now, his ego got in the way concerning the four companies of the 2nd Cavalry. He also turned that down because he said the 7th Cavalry can win any battle against any enemy. His ego got ahead. Just like Fetterman, give me 80 men and I'll take care of the whole Sioux Nation. Custer had a little bit of that in. He said the 7th Cavalry needs no help. The 7th Cavalry can handle anything we meet. Those were two big mistakes, by the way. Now, Gibbon gave Custer six Crow Scouts to go with him. And he gave him one civilian scout, a guy by the name of Mitch Boyer, which is on your sheet. So in addition to offering the Gatlin guns and offering four companies in the 2nd Cavalry, Terry also offered six Indian scouts and one civilian scout who was very good, Mitch Boyer. Did he accept those? Yes, no, he took those. He took the scouts. So he was given six Indian scouts, Crow scouts, and one civilian scout, Mitch Boyer. So, at 12 noon 
On June 22nd, 1876, Custer and the 7th Cavalry left the far west and began their march up Rosebud Creek toward the Wolf Mountains at 12 noon, June 22nd, 1876. Custer departs the far west and begins his march. All of his soldiers, here's what they were armed with. This is what each soldier, soldier had with them at the time of departure. They had a single shot 45 caliber pistol. They had a model 1873 Springfield carbine. Does anybody know what they are? 1873 Springfield carbine. Is it, is it a repeater? No, it's called a trap door. And what happened is you'd flip it, it was a gun, you'd flip it open, stick the 4570 shell in, flip it down, shoot. Flip it open, stick the shell in, like that. It was better than the old, you know, the old musket ones. But you had to open it up and put a shell in each time and shoot. Pretty good weaponry for that time. They weren't Spencer repeating rifles, but they were Springfield 1873s. So each soldier had a 45 caliber pistol and a model 1873 4570 rifle. And they were given 50 rounds of pistol ammunition and 50 rounds of rifle ammunition. So that's what each soldier had with him when they departed with Custer on June 22nd, 1876 at noon. Pistol, 45 caliber pistol, model 1873 Springfield rifle, which is fairly new at that time, because when was this battle take place? 1876. Okay, and 50 rounds of ammunition for each weapon. So 1876, more than 18 what? 70 rifle? They are 1873s. Okay? Now, officers also had their own personal weapons besides what they were given. Sabres, that type of thing. But no infantrymen had sabres. Why? They collected their sabres because it would impede their march. Okay? Now, if you look at the Battle of the Little Bighorn when we get to it, they're not all dressed in military uniforms. They weren't required. So some men were straw hats, white shirts, they, they didn't have, everyone didn't look the same militarily, okay? Custer himself was in buckskin, okay? So there was no military uniforms required. Now here's the key to this whole thing. Custer gets his orders. He gets ready to go. We told you he left at noon. Terry looks at Custer and says, quote, now listen to this. Custer, don't be greedy. Wait for us. Custer's response was, no, I won't. No, I won't be greedy and I'll wait for you, or no, I won't wait for you. That's still up to debate. Again, Terry says, Custer, don't be greedy. Wait for us. And Custer's response is, no, I won't. No, I won't be greedy, or no, I won't wait for you. Nobody will know what he had in his mind at that time. Okay. So Custer departed the far west at noon on June 2nd. He traveled 12 miles and camped. I'm going to kind of give you his route. He traveled 12 miles and camped. So he departs at noon on June 22nd. They travel 12 miles and camp. They get up early the morning of June 23rd. They march 33 miles and camp at about 5 o'clock in the evening. So they leave at noon on the 22nd. They travel 12 miles and camp. The next morning they're up early. They march 33 miles and camp again. It's about 5 o'clock in the evening when they camp the second night. They get up the next morning, Saturday, June 24th. They start marching at 5 a.m. They go 28 miles and camp again, about 2 o'clock. So on Saturday, June 24th, they're up early. They leave at 5 a.m. They march about 28 miles and go into camp about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, they were curious. They stopped at 2 o'clock because they were still looking for what? The Indians. So that evening, Custer called a guy by the name of Charles Barnum. And Charles Barnum was his chief of scouts. He was a lieutenant, and he was the head of all the scouts. 
civilian and Indian scouts. He, he was the man in charge of them. And Custer calls for Barnum that evening and asks to visit with him. The Crow scouts believed strongly that the Sioux were where? In the Little Bighorn Valley. And Custer wanted to see it for himself. So he called Barnum and asked him to take him to a high point in the Wolf Mountains known as the Crow's Nest. Okay, it was a known landmark in the, in the Wolf Mountains. So as they get in at 2 o'clock on that day, they rest up that evening. Custer calls for Charles Barnum, his chief of scouts, head of the scouts. He says, the Crow scouts tell us they believe that the hostiles are in the Little Bighorn River Valley. Will you please take me to this crow's nest, which was the highest point in the Wolf Mountains, and let me see for myself. And Barnum chose to do that, took Custer to the crow's nest. So Barnum went with Custer, he took Mitch Boyer also, remember Mitch Boyer, the civilian scout? And he also took a guide they had with him that knew the land well by the name of Charlie Reynolds. So. Charles Barnum, Chief of Scouts, takes Custer, civilian scout Mitch Boyer, and a guide by the name of Charlie Reynolds, and they all go to this place known as the Crow's Nest to get a good view. Custer, in the meantime, tells his soldiers who just quit, remember that afternoon, to keep your horses saddled as he went up to the crow's nest. Why would he tell them that? If they find him and they need to attack, they want to have be ready to go. So his soldiers were camped and resting, but normally you took the saddles off your horses when you camped. He told them to keep the saddles on in case he needed them to advance to the crow's nest quickly. Okay? Any questions on that? Okay, we are done for today. Tomorrow... I'm not sure what Mr. Vickers was going to do. I think he's going to have me come in one more day with the history kids. And I think we'll be right back here again tomorrow. Friday, Mr. Vickers is going to decide what he's going to do with you history kids and the information you've got. And Mr. McGee wants me to continue on yep. with this lecture Friday with you guys for his annotation. You... Yeah. Okay, the English people can go. The history people got to stay. received the military victory he desperately needed to get back on the map after his suspension. Uh, <laughs> Ten, what? Nope. Okay, Anselik, you get to try and answer that now. Question was, where did Custer get the victory he needed to get back on the map after his suspension for a year? Okay. You were here. Matter of fact, I said you oh. got to take notes. And you looked at me and you said, "Well, I'll get it off the field tonight." Oh. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, well, my point is, you might you might not get out of here. Are these questions from yesterday? These are today's. Hey, Mr. Santo. Okay. Family resident. Oh. No. Your turn, Billy. Washita. Washita. Hey, Billy's got his one. I'll keep track of these. I'll keep track of them. How many do you have to answer right? Three today. Three. Okay, Mr. Nielsen. I'm 
Oh, what was the name of the man that went off to get a group of Cheyenne Indians and Custer didn't wait for him and he took criticism for never finding him? Joel Elliott? Joel Elliott, that's right. This is all today, girls. Yeah. Back to you, Sam. Sam, easy one. Wait, wait. Because, of, because, because of Custer's failure to support Joel Elliott when he took off at Washita, his off, his, his, some of his officers and some of his enlisted men were pretty ticked off at him. One in particular really was oh, mad at him. Know. Who was that? And it ended up showing poor relationships all the way through to build that bad little big one. Frederick Ben. 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 Yep, very good. Okay, Ansley. What was the name of the Secretary of War that was in trouble for possibly making illegal monies on Indians that Custer went and testified in his trial? <laughs> and on sleeps in the year till tomorrow. Yeah, I know. Um, Ten seconds. I have an idea. Okay, Mr. Know. Santos, who is that? Okay, who is the Secretary of War that was under trial? Dome. What? Dome. What was his name? Read it. Um, you always should have your shoes out in front of you. Always should have your shoes out. Okay, okay Billy. Who is the guy who was under trial? W.W. Belknap. W. W. Belknap. Billy's got two already. I answered that. How many you got? <laughs> you didn't say Belknap. You didn't say Belknap. Yeah, you said Belknap. Okay, how many you got, Lane? One. Okay. Right now. All right. General Sheridan was the guy that went to bat for Custer the first time when he got suspended and talked to Grant about reinstating me. After this trial mess, in which Grant got pissed at Custer and relieved him of all of his duties, which general went and talked to Grant this time to get Custer a reprieve? You better think about that, because he can't get it to you. Well, it was, wait, the Sheridan guy got him out the first time. Right, so who got him out the second time? Who, was, who went and talked to the President the second time? These two guys were very big favorites of President Grant and Patsy. Ten seconds. <laughs> Terry? Ah, your turn, Sam. Who was it? William Sherman. That's right. So how many you got? Two. Okay, how many got, Ansley? Zero. Zero? Okay. Uh. Okay, Ansley, let's get you on the board. What was the name of the steamship that these people met on to discuss? Ooh. Or when you got one. Okay. How many got, Santos? Zero. Santos. One. Okay, Santos. Who was the commander of the Montana Column of the campaign of 1876? The Montana Column. You got good notes there. You should have all this stuff. The Montana Column. Who was in charge of the Montana Column? Okay. The Montana Column. Who was in charge of that? Who was that one for you? Montana Column. Who was in charge of the Montana Column? You phone. Was it correct? Read about down the bottom. Who was head of the Mons had a call? John Gibbon. That's the I knew you had it. You said fine. How many got? Okay, Billy, how many got? Two. Okay, who was in charge of the Wyoming call? That was Crook. Crook, you're out of here. Billy, don't lose your numbers out of here. How many got, Lake? One. All right. Okay, tell me, Lane, this is up your alley. Why in the world did, did uh, the officers wait to pay the soldiers? Oh. After they camp the first night, rather than rather than doing that, go out get drunk to get hookers. That's right, prostitutes say that all that time. Okay, how many you got? Two. Okay, how many you got, Sam? Two. Okay. You're making an easy one, please. <laughs> Who was the guy when the Crow Scouts came over the hill yelling "Sue, Sue, 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 Sue"? Who did General Crook send to push the hostiles back so he could get organized? Who did he push? Have, who did he send to push him back? Um, a captain. He had to take soldiers and push them back over the ridge so he could get over. Uh, nope. <laughs> Ansley. Who was the guy? Who was the guy that 
Crook told to push the hostile Indians back over the ridge so he could get organized. Captain Santos, I'll bet you've got it. I think it was on. Santos? You don't have it. You can, I'll give you time to take a guess. Is it on the sheet? Might be if it's a name, usually it is. He's a captain with it. Mills? Anson Mills. How many you got? Mills. You got two? You only got two, right? Uh, this is two. That's yeah, okay. All right, how many you got? I got two. Okay, all right. Give me the three reasons why Crook decided not to advance to the far west after the Battle of the Rosebud. Three reasons why he decided not to continue on. Wait, what he gave uh, Custer? No, General Crook fought the Battle oh, of the Rosebud. The three reasons uh, why he didn't continue because on. Because his men... What about him? Uh, they were uh, injured and wounded. Okay. They were wounded. Um, what was another reason? Ammunition. What about it? He didn't have a block of the he had zero. Four, uh, yeah, he had zero. Yeah, yeah. okay. And? And valleys. To, How about the valleys? He didn't want to be like <laughs> the, other one, the other guy. You get worked over. You're yeah. done. You're done. <laughs> All right, how many, got, how many you got there, Sam? Two. Okay. How long did Crook stay on Goose Creek after the Battle of the Rosebud? Oh, my God. How many days? Here, why are you giving me the hard one? It isn't hard. How many I days? We how many days? How many days did he spend there? How many days did he spend on Goose Creek? Wait, which one? Crook left the Rosebud, Battle of the Rosebud, went back to Goose Creek because of, because of one of the reasons that Lane gave, that he was out of ammunition, he had wounded soldiers, he didn't want to get caught in the valleys, and he stayed at Goose Creek for how long? Matter of fact, I told you, on the day that Custer was killed, he caught 100, they caught 100 fish. 18 days? Nope. Ansel Lee? How many days? Eight days. That's right! How many you got? All right, so everybody's got two now? Okay, Santos. You're giving me the hard ones and I have three. <laughs> How many soldiers was the 7th Cavalry made up of when they left? Fort Lincoln. How many, of the, just the 7th Cavalry, one Cavalry? Not the Dakota Column, not the Montana Column, not the Wyoming Column. How many men did the 7th Cavalry have? He's got a, he's a good note kid. <laughs> you might get a chance if they can. He doesn't have a doubt. What do you think? How many did? Did he have? Nope. Your turn, Samantha. Thought. More than that. More than what? More than fifty. Yep. Seventh Cavalry. Nope. Your turn, Ansley. Less than 900. More than 450. I'll let, after this, I'm going to let you guess, and then we're just going to go high, low. What are you saying? 750. Lower. Six. Higher. 650. Correct! Yes! Okay, she's done. All right. Oh, wait, no, I have, like, no yes. Okay, Ansley, who is Miles Keel? Miles Keel? Keel. Miles, Miles Keel. Keel. <laughs> who is Miles Keel? Wait a minute. Keel. Sandy looks very nice to you, Thank you. Miles Keel. Brain is melting. You know? I don't know, I just thought he was crushed out of the or something. What about him? He was like white like, There you go. You're good. Santos. Who is Grant Marsh? Grant Marsh. Grant Marsh. Oh, Grant Marsh. Wasn't he the leader of the? Grant Marsh. He was. He was what in the far west? So. What was he as concerning the far west? What was he on the far west? What did he have to do with it? Captain? Yeah, he was the head of the far west. He, he was the commander of the far west. What a woman. 
All right, you're out of here. Commander of the bar, got the best notes and get out of here last. Incredible. He's got to review those notes. The other thing is like, that you take good notes, but you do not get them on in your brain, right? I do, and then... Huh? I answered that one. I would have been out of here. You take good notes. Yeah, You're good. I answered that one. But which one? No, you said Bell, Bellman. You said. Yeah. Bell, how about my congratulation? Congratulation, I'm going to say Santos uh, Ramoris. I'm going to say Santos Ramoris. How would you like that?